With Circuits V1 falling out of favor and Circuits V2 becoming the new norm, it is very unlikely that any new Circuits V1 features will be coming to Rec Room. Now that the creative team is also now cutting down support for Circuits V1 based classes, as stated by Trunks on the Discord a few weeks ago, uh, for the next few weeks I'll be uploading tutorials on every category of Circuits V1 for any of the last minute learners. Though Circuits V1 may have its usage removed, or it will become a legacy feature, this tutorial will help either way. Quick note, do not worry about any Circuits V1 inventions or rooms, for those will not have their functionality removed. Let's start with the math chips. Of course, first you're going to want to start by getting your maker pen. First go to your watch, go to backpack, go to tools, and then press use on the maker pen. Like they're spawn in front of you or in your hand, depending on what platform you use. To go to the math chips category, you're going to, going to go to the palette, go to gadgets, and then go to math chips, which we all have here. Of course, first we're going to start with the balloon chip. The balloon chip's capabilities are all directly correlated to the word on the front facing portion of the chip. When configuring the balloon chip, you have three systems and, or, and not. To start with the basic and, and works as when two outputs, or as many outputs as you are giving it, all have a signal, it will then output a signal of true or false. For example, when I have two toggle buttons on the current toggle value, both wired to this, when both of them are on, it'll send an output here. But when, since they are both off, it'll send an output here. If I were to toggle one on, it will still send a false output because both are not on. So, if I were to turn on the other one, now it is sending a true signal, and this one is currently off. Or is also extremely similar. It has both the true and false values, except it cuts out the middle step that AND had. If I turn one on, then it will still send a signal. If I were to turn this one on, it'll also still send a signal. But if both are turned off, it will stop sending a signal, and instead send a signal to the false pin. Or works in all ways that AND does, but instead it just cuts out that middle feature of at least both of them have to be on. Finally, we have the configure for not. Ooh, that's a bug. Don't mind the bug here. Let's just move that out of the way. The not chip does the exact opposite of whatever output is sent here. If this sends a 1 output and puts the output here, it'll send a 0 output. If I were to turn this off, it is now sending a 1 output. It's really just as simple as that. Next, we have the Combinator chip. As similar for all the chips, its symbol on the front of the chip is what displays its action. For example, the plus will add all of these numbers and values together to give that its output. Thus, for demonstration purposes, I will be using these two values that from earlier to show how it adds. When both are toggled on, it'll send an output of 2, because both of these pins are getting 1, adding that together is 2. It can add up to a total of 3 values, but you can stack another combinator chip onto another one to get a similar output as this. And I'll give it 3. Of course, the combinator chip doesn't only work for addition. It works for any values of subtraction, multiplication, division, and just percentage capabilities. Use an example of another one. When subtracting this value of 1 from this value of 1, it'll give an output of 0. For anyone who knows basic math, this is the chip for you. Next, we have the compare chip. The compare chip, as the combinator chip and the boolean chip, have multiple different values, which are all displayed on the symbol of the front of the chip. Instead of combinating chips, It'll compare values from different chips to send an output of true or false. It's kind of a mix of the combinator and boolean chip, but with a different purpose. For example, if the button is toggled off and one of the value is supposed to be equal to zero, that is a false. That is that is not true, so it'll output a false. But if it were true, so if one were to equal one, then it would be true. 
If you were looking at earlier, you would see what this advanced mode does. If you were to click advanced mode, it allows you to set the values that will be outputted by the true or false pin. So if 1 were to equal 1, which is true, the signal will be sent as 0. If it were not true, then the signal sent by the else chip, or else pin, would also be 0 because it's set here as 0. If I were to put this one as, let's just put this as 7, and the, this value at 2, when false, it will send an output of 7, and when true, it will send an output of 2. All different states are pretty easy to understand. This is if it's not equal to, this is if it's greater than, greater than or equal to, less than, or less than or equal to. Next, the random chip. The randomizer chip has two main features, to save and store player data, and to generate a random number when you give it the signal to. For this one, I'm only going to need one button to demonstrate how the system works. For the, for the record, this button tells me when to generate the signal. And these are the values of the minimum value that it will randomize to, and this is the maximum value it will randomize to. By according to this logic, when I press the button, it will randomize a number between 0 and 0, which will equal 0. As expected. If I were to set this minimum value to 1, and its maximum value to 7, for say, it'll pick a random number between 1 and 7. It can be equal to 1 or 7, it could just be any number between these. Dot 5. When configuring the randomizer chip, you have two things, continuous and pulse. Continuous makes it so that this number that it's given will be always active until another number is generated. If not on continuous and instead pulse, it'll only send this number for a split second of, I believe, 10 hertz. So, as mentioned before, you can also save player data, but you'll need a input that allows you to generate player data. In the case of saving player data, get anything that can keep track of players, it's in a player output, and wire it to all pins to lock it. Of course, this will have to only be on continuous or it will not work. So if I were to get my player data, which I believe will be 1, oop, I'll touch this trigger zone, and now it should output a player signal of 1, because that is my player value, I can use this to do anything player-wise. I give myself stats for the leaderboard chip in a different category, or literally anything else. Next, we have the variable chip. The variable chip is extremely simple and is the base routing for outputting a signal. If I were to configure this, I can set the value that it outputs on any of its pins. So if I want the red pin to be output to 3, the green pin to be outed to 4, and I want the blue output to be 6, it'll then output that according symbol, or according number, for each of the pins. This number is locked and is non-changeable because there are no input pins at all on the variable chip. Finally, we have the most complex chip, the wave chip. The wave chip is really for anyone who's taken Physics 1 classes for school and can understand the basic principles of wave and how it works. I'm not going to try and teach Physics 1, but the basics of the chip are it cycles between two the values of numbers in between Kind of like the randomizer chip with having a minimum and maximum, but that minimum and maximum is one value, and it instantly, it constantly rotates between those numbers back and forth. So if I were to put an output of 7, it'll go between 7 and negative 7, back and forth and back and forth, as long as it's set by the, by the uh, wave chip. The wave chip has several different modes, which are all displayed on the screen, or the front of the chip, on what it does. Starting with the input pins, the on and off pin tells the chip when to start outputting signal values to switch between the amplitudes. The amplitude is the maximum number that it can cycle to. So as my example earlier of 7, it'll cycle between 7 and negative 7, going back and forth between those numbers. The cycle duration, also known as the period, is tell tells the chip how fast it should cycle between the numbers. As you probably saw earlier, the period input units can be between seconds and 0.1 seconds. To go over the different modes, the sine wave starts at the middle between the two amplitudes and cycles to the top amplitude, which is the number that you say here, back down to its inverse, and then back, and then forth, and back, and then forth. 
Cosine starts at the original amplitude and then goes down to the inverse and then back up and then back up. Co the difference between sine and cosine are is what amplitude it starts at. The square wave shoots instantaneously between the two amplitudes. So as an example earlier of 7, it'll shoot from 7 to negative 7 to 7 to negative 7, back and forth in instantaneously with no differentiating numbers in between as the other modes do. Next, the triangle wave. The triangle wave makes the oscillation a lot sharper. It starts as the cosine does at the first amplitude and shoots back and forth, but with less of a wave feeling, making the numbers more sharp. I don't know exactly how to describe it perfectly, but it just makes the cycling a lot more, like, it makes it ba more basic. The sawtooth wave is the most interesting mode. It starts at the inverse amplitude and then shoots up as the triangle wave does to the normal amplitude. But as the square wave does, it shoots back then down to the inverse amplitude, and then back up as the triangle. It goes back and forth pretty much like a sawtooth, as it is described. And that's pretty much it for the math chips. See you in the next video for game chips.